Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the Right Honourable the Lord Mayor, Alderman Roger Gifford. Secretary-General, Your Excellencies, fellow Aldermen, Sheriffs, ladies and gentlemen, it is my very great pleasure to welcome you all to Guild Hall this evening, where we are proud to host this, the 16th Commonwealth Foundation Lecture, following on from the great success of last year's event, at which Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, author of Half of a Yellow Sun, spoke on the theme of connecting cultures and especially her pleasure about stories that give both learning and joy, that cross national and personal boundaries in doing so. Her ringing conclusion has stayed with me that we should read human stories to be instructed and to be delighted. She quoted a South African writer who responded to the question, why do you write, with the answer, I am building a stairway to the stars. I have the authority to take the whole of mankind up there with me. That is why I write. That perhaps suggests something of the greatness of the Commonwealth, that it too is about the whole of humanity, a rich mix of nations and peoples, all connected one with another. It was a shared goal captured by Her Majesty the Queen in her Commonwealth message this week that the Commonwealth was about individuals and communities finding ways to strive together to create a better future that is beneficial for us all, and a future informed by the values of the new Commonwealth Charter of peace, democracy, development, justice, and human values. It is an ever-present challenge to ground those values and ideas in the reality of the lives of millions of our fellow citizens. It is also a challenge for business and for the City of London, continuing to show that we serve and support the wider community and the society of which we are part. And it is a challenge for our political institutions. How can they best represent the people they serve? How do they maintain their legitimacy? Most importantly, in a world of constant and rapid technological change, how can the peoples of the world have their voices heard? So we are grateful indeed to Rickon Patel for his own contribution. Rickon is the founding president and executive director of Avaz, a word meaning voice. Avaz is making a huge contribution to giving voice to the concerns and the needs of our fellow citizens, wherever they are and it does so by making the most of the opportunities created by new technology. It has been described as a coalition of practical idealists, helping to bridge the gap between the world we have and the world we want, and the new media that the organization uses to such great effect is already helping to make those ideas a reality. In one respect, the Arab Spring was about democratic change not through traditional institutions, but through Facebook and Twitter, about a great coalition of the popular will manifesting itself online. These are extraordinary times. Ricken was voted ultimate game changer in politics in a survey in the Huffington Post, and his work in countries such as Sierra Leone, Liberia, Sudan, and Afghanistan has demonstrated the value of careful, considered efforts to find common ground, to make people of violence eschew an armed struggle and come to the negotiating table. I make no comment on another survey which listed him as one of the world's most eligible bachelors. <clears throat> This evening, Ricken is speaking on opportunity through enterprise, a theme close to the hearts of the City of London. Because there is no better guarantee of human dignity than work and the opportunity for each individual to find economic security and better him or herself. So thank you to Ricken Patel for delivering this year's Commonwealth Lecture and thank you to the Commonwealth Foundation for all it does to build up civil society. And now can I invite the chair of the foundation, Sir Anand Satyanand, to say a few words. Thank you, Sir Anand, and also our thanks to the Commonwealth Secretary General, Kamalesh Sharma, 
for all he does in supporting the Commonwealth and its family of nations. I am only sorry I cannot stay, although I leave you in the hands of a distinguished former Lord Mayor, Sir David Howard. Thank you. Mr. Lord Mayor and Aldermen, Your Excellencies and many representatives of Commonwealth countries and organisations, distinguished guests otherwise, ladies and gentlemen. It is a privilege in my first public engagement as Chairman of the Commonwealth Foundation to be able to introduce Rikhen Patel a remarkable international personality to deliver the 2013 Commonwealth Lecture. I first acknowledge the historic venue in which we meet. Guildhall in its 600 year history has been host to many important addresses to which this evening's proceeding will now be added. Guildhall's placement within London and London's placement with regard to the worldwide Commonwealth is a powerful symbol of centrality for the lecture. Thus thanks are due to the Lord Mayor for the cooperation and partnership that has been encouraged with the Commonwealth Foundation. The Commonwealth Lecture is one of the crucial occasions for the Commonwealth Foundation in each year. The Foundation's remit is to encourage Commonwealth people to learn and then engage with each other and their institutions to advance their lives and its quality. This lecture as well as other initiatives such as the Commonwealth Book Prize, the broadcast Commonwealth Short Stories, and the Commonwealth Short Films Exposition serve the remit well. I observed this personally at the Films event in Auckland, New Zealand during the last fortnight. I look forward in my time as chairman, now less than 50 days old, to take suitable time to acquaint myself with my new colleagues and to evaluate the way in which this organisation is working on delivery of its new constitution and then to making a satisfying contribution. I come from a background in the law and in institutions which serve the contemporary needs of society. I see myself having as centrepieces the encouragement of civic education and citizen engagement as a means of promoting better governance. And I am fortunate that my country, New Zealand, is one that provides fairness, diversity and participation by all groups. This year's Commonwealth theme is well known opportunity through enterprise. This evening's lecture will enable us to reflect on the idea that the Commonwealth Foundation is happily placed to advance, that of seeing enterprise as something more than pursuit of a score on the bottom line, and being associated with a larger and more ambitious pursuit that encourages and enables every Commonwealth person to participate in processes that affect their own development. The phrase, nothing about us without us, comes to mind. This all leads to the focus that I should properly bring to our distinguished speaker, Rikhen Patel. I have described him as an international personality. But there is first to be mentioned his birth in Canada, 
with parents whose forebears were also part of the Commonwealth. After studies in this country and the United States, he has worked for a number of international organisations, always with a focus on citizen engagement and empowerment. Notable among these is, of course, Avaz.org, which is said to be the largest global campaigning web movement in history to date. There is, ladies and gentlemen, an abiding challenge for the Commonwealth and its organisations to produce materials and events that are relevant. I anticipate, Mr Patel, as I ask you to present the lecture, that you will deliver on that score handsomely. You may be assured of a warmly disposed and interested audience. May I invite you to address us. Well, thank you so much for those wonderful introductions. And thank you to the Commonwealth Foundation for its great work and for this opportunity. I also want to thank my dream come true team at Avaz and the amazing Avaz community, 20 million strong this weekend. Thank you. In many ways, I am here not by my own achievements, but by theirs. Can I also say that this is a big deal for me? I feel like my whole life has been a journey through learning and living and testing some of the thoughts that I want to share tonight. And until now, I've never felt ready or maybe worthy to share these things that I feel so deeply publicly. So thank you really for coming and listening to me. I hope you find it useful. Something big is happening. From Tahrir Square to Wall Street, from staggeringly brave citizen journalists in Syria to millions of citizens winning campaign after campaign for change, democracy is stirring. Not the media circus, corrupt, vote every four years democracy of the past. Something much, much deeper. Deep within ourselves, we are realizing our power to build the world we dream of. But we don't have a lot of time to do it. Our planet is threatened by multiple crises, a climate crisis, food crisis, financial crisis, biodiversity, nuclear proliferation. These crises could split us apart or bring us together like never before. It's the challenge and the opportunity of our time and the outcome will determine whether our children face a darker world or one thriving in greater human harmony. Tonight, I want to talk about this moment, this profound opportunity, and how we as nations, organizations, communities, and individuals can seize it. The Copenhagen Climate Conference in 2009 felt to me a bit like that decade's Woodstock, or Spanish Civil War. Tens of thousands of people gathered from every corner of the world to help save our planet. But I also felt there was something of an air of the Titanic about it. I remember one committed person who said something like, I know we're probably not going to save our planet, but I'm not going down without a fight. Well, we won and lost at Copenhagen, but I feel that when you take the long view, that kind of pessimism is tragic and unjustified and sadly too common. So I want to start with what I believe are our tremendous reasons for hope. If you look at our recent history, over the last few decades, the progress is astonishing. In the last 30 years, we've cut global poverty from nearly 50% of the human race to approaching 15%. At the current rate, our generation will be the last to know poverty. Look at democracy. We're in an unprecedented growth of democratic governance in the world today. 
for the first time in human history, over half of the world's peoples live under democratic governance. Look at war. Deaths in war have been declining for 30 years, and since the Cold War powers stopped stoking their proxy wars across our planet over a quarter century ago, the incidence of war has dramatically declined, both interstate and civil war. Income per person is up 90% over the last 30 years. If you believe that prosperity is a necessary requirement for us to climb that hierarchy of needs, it's clearly escalating. And perhaps the most powerful trend of the last 50 years is the unprecedented empowerment of women. The number of women members of parliament has gone from 1,800 to over 10,000 since 1980. For the first time, half of our species is being liberated to bring their full genius, emotional intelligence, and wisdom to every sector of our societies. There is perhaps no more powerful influence on the things I want to talk about tonight. On dozens of metrics, literacy, life expectancy, internet access, we can see gargantuan historic progress. It's a basis for profound optimism. And it's a tragic fact that fatalism and cynicism are still so rife in our world today. Hope is something that springs fresh in the face of evidence. But all the evidence we have suggests that when human beings pursue collective aims together, we can achieve what we aim at. I felt hopeless at times of failure or defeat. But then I remember that fatalism and cynicism are not just at best futile and at worst self-fulfilling prophecies. They are also incompetent. Practical idealism is not just our only hope. It's just good sense. So much more than just having a reason to hope, we have a responsibility to dream. Because all our progress has been achieved by enterprising people who dreamed and worked hard from Dag Hammarskjöld and the building of the United Nations, to Eleanor Roosevelt and the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, to Malala, a teenage girl whose dream of education for all girls in Pakistan could not be stopped by a Taliban bullet. Memory, history, is consciousness. But it's a peculiar feature of our history that we often remember and mark our tyrants and madmen, wars and warriors, more than the practical dreamers who built, brick by patient brick, the civilization we stand in today. And when I let myself dream, the deeply exciting thing that I feel is that all of this progress has been fueled by and is fueling something much deeper. Deep within ourselves, we are realizing that power to shape the world we live in. There is a march of democracy sweeping across the world today, not just in the millions who gather to end a despot's rule, or the tens of millions who join campaign after campaign, but a revolution across every sector in our societies. Not just a new media, but a new politics, a new activism, a new democracy. The individual now has unprecedented power to access and publish, to connect, to organize, to affect. Power and agency is being spread out, flattened. And this march is not chaotic. It has a vector. It's bringing us together. Our increasing ability to connect to each other is showing us that we are not as different as we thought we were. The moral distance between us is closing, and we are realizing that every human life is equally precious to us. All the barriers we've known of race, nationality, language, culture, religion, sexuality are coming down. And as they do, we see ourselves in the other, and our capacity to act with empathy and solidarity with one another is escalating. All the fictions we were sold of the differences between us, of the evils of the other, are being shown to be untrue. John F. Kennedy tried to bridge the gap between Cold War rivals, calling on people to realize that we all breathe the same air, that we all love our children. But we're realizing that we share vastly more than that. Psychologists are telling us that our internal mental environments are far more similar to each other's than we think. We don't just breathe the same air. We overwhelmingly share all the same loves and fears and hopes for ourselves, our work, our families, and our societies. Our, our media and political leaders have not told us this story enough because they are incentivized to focus on and often stoke our conflicts and our differences. But surveys of public opinion show 
that there is a world that most people everywhere want. 96% of people worldwide want stronger protections for the environment. 87% want stronger protections for human rights. 86% want concerted action to reduce poverty and similar numbers, corruption. These might sound like no-brainers, but think about it. Most countries now have a Ministry of the Environment and a host of legal protections that businesses can find cumbersome. And yet still, 96% of people want more. But beyond alignment on goals, we also see overwhelming majorities on many of the means by which we reach our goals. 79% of people want a global treaty with clear emissions limits that will stop climate change. Almost two-thirds of people want to strengthen the United Nations, and that number rises when you include a commitment to reform. What about the conflicts? The real divisions? Well, there are some, no doubt. But as far as most people are concerned, far less than we might think. Many people believe that Muslims in the Middle East are deeply anti-American. But in a massive survey effort by Gallup, they concluded that, quote, Muslims don't hate America's freedom, they want it. And that the principal problem that Muslims have with the US is not with their values or people, but that their foreign policy in the Middle East has undermined freedom for much of the last 60 years. And George W. Bush himself is on record agreeing with this. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is perhaps the most intractable conflict, our hardest nut, where extremists on both sides have worked for decades to demonize the other. Even there, majorities of both Israelis and Palestinians, as well as the world, support a fairly well-defined two-state solution. We know what the deal looks like if we can free ourselves from the grip of the hardliners in Israel, Palestine, and Washington. All these common desires reflect an understanding of our fundamental interests at the bottom of this march of democracy. In his phenomenal book, Non-Zero, Robert Wright powerfully argues that the arc of human history is characterized by the progressive realization of gradually larger groups of people that our interests are not zero-sum, not inimical to each other's. The structure of our interests across the board is win-win. This reality and our progressive realization of it is part of what is driving the opportunity of our time. But progress is not now and never has been inevitable. Our connectedness and our progress have brought with it an age of radical interdependence. We are both closer to each other than ever before with unprecedented care and more vulnerable to each other than ever before with unprecedented capacity to do each other harm. Take our biosphere. The universe that human life can inhabit is razor thin. Three kilometers below our feet, it's too hot to survive. Three kilometers above our heads, the air is too thin to breathe. You could walk across the living universe in your lunchtime. This razor-thin biosphere that sustains us survives by a delicate, miraculous balance, and we have the power to threaten it. If I light a match, the carbon from it will go into our atmosphere and affect every other human being on the planet equally. I will use up a share of the remaining carbon our biosphere can absorb and bring us all closer to a series of tipping points, points where excess carbon gas so it acidifies our oceans that it kills off the plankton that we need to be eating the carbon. Points where our Arctic tundra thaws and releases billions of tons of methane gas, 75 times as toxic as carbon, into our atmosphere. My action is within my control, but the consequences of that action is to move us closer to a catastrophic chain reaction that is beyond any of our control. Beyond climate change, we face a host of vulnerabilities to each other. The failure of the US and other governments to adequately regulate its banking industry, or the tax avoidance and corruption of Greek and other elites can trigger chain reactions that threaten the world with a great depression. Contagion is a word that vividly describes how, whether it is global pandemics or market panic, our fates are bound up with each other. 
In an age of radical interdependence, everything, both good and bad, is becoming more contagious. And as the strain we place on the, Earth's, on the Earth rises, our vital resources are becoming scarce. Food supply is in question as countries scramble to buy vast tracts of land to feed their future. Water supplies are strained by usage of communities and nations upstream and downstream. We are facing a new global scarcity. And scarcity can breed competition and conflict or cooperation. Each of these crises are collective action crises. They can be solved if we work together. But if we cannot, the consequences will be catastrophic. They could bring us together or split us apart like never before. That's the challenge and the opportunity of our time. So what stands in our way? We have this inspiring march of democracy. We have this tremendous alignment of people everywhere on what we want and what we need to accomplish. What's slowing us down? It's not because tyrants stand in our way. The age of tyrants is passing. But we're moving into an age of tyrannical systems, of unseen, hard to engage with, hard to understand systems hidden from our view that frustrate and dilute and distract and obstruct the democratic will, the desires of most people everywhere. Systems like the corporate capture of government in the lobbyocracies that many of our countries are becoming, where economic interests have a natural incentive to maximize profit by funding and incentivizing political leaders to serve their private interests above the common good, undermining both democracy and a healthy market economy. Systems like our winner-take-all domestic politics, where political factions are incentivized to exaggerate the differences we perceive between each other because they stand to gain from the conflict that results. Or the equivalent in international politics, where extremists on either side of a conflict stoke war to shore up the domestic support they need to, to take and keep power. Systems like the media industrial complex, where barons like Rupert Murdoch and Silvio Berlusconi are able to manage democracies to their ends by manipulating the information that citizens have. And often these barons are the biggest drivers of our system of it bleeds, it leads media, which finds that like sex, fear, smell, fear sells. Systems like oligarchy and plutocracy, where a small group of families or a tiny class of wealthy individuals sometimes generously named the 1%, operate from a conveniently unquestioned ideology that justifies subverting democracy to their ends. That one sounds classist, and no one should be demonized for their wealth. But we must also face the fact that major banks are writing memos to their wealthiest clients, identifying countries like the United States as emerging plutonomies, and recommending their clients get in on the gravy train. And finally, Systems like our dysfunctional international order, in which a club of state governments, half of whom are undemocratic, guard their power too jealously, blocking or diluting to the point of ineffectiveness thousands upon thousands of sensible global cooperative efforts that could improve our lives or save them. At the UN, I, I once watched private negotiations of our nation's representatives for two weeks as they addressed, often late into the night, the burning issue of how to help the millions of people internally displaced in war. It was a paper world. The stakes already reduced to little more than what declaration to make. But even in that declaration, one by one, every word of substance and meaning and any prospect of producing change was stripped from the document because someone disagreed with it, most often Sudan or Algeria or the United States. The structure of our international systems are not designed to optimize for the enlightened long-term interests of our nations and peoples. They're designed to minimize any potential short-term clash with one nation or government. They're built upon fear of each other more than hope in shared enterprise. Instead of the highest common denominator, they are the lowest common denominator. Every common value is sacrificed to the value of inclusion, of keeping everyone in the tent. There is another way, and it's not a utopia. We have only to look to the European Union, or with reservations, the WTO, for a model of transnationalism where inclusion carries significant responsibilities as well as rights. Such a question of highest versus lowest common denominator is before this Commonwealth of Nations right now in choosing whether to be led and chaired 
by a government that has been accused of massive human rights abuses. On this question and others like it, I believe our heads of state must meet their responsibility to listen to and serve the people of the world and our long-term interests. So corporate capture, gladiatorial politics, oligarchy, media complexes, lowest common denominator global governance, these are the kinds of systems that prevent that expression of the common will and that stand in the way of the profound opportunity we face in our time. But we can over overcome and reform them if we work together. To do so, we must confront the greatest source of their power, the power of fear to divide us. Across the world, a hopeful politics of community and cooperation is in tension with a fearful politics of competition and conflict. The stresses of our interdependence and vulnerability are profound. Instead of wisely understanding the problems we face, opportunists can exploit fear to encourage us to blame them on the other, to demonize and divide. Instead of cooperating in a win-win effort, we scramble for a slice of the pie. But you might say these tensions are age old. They've played out throughout our history. We might be tempted to accept that that's the way things will always be. But they can't be, because the stakes have changed. Beyond these crises of radical interdependence, our capacities, our very power threatens us. Atomic energy was the first doomsday power that humanity created, giving potentially one individual the power to wipe out human life. And soon after we invented it, we came within a hair's breadth of actually doing that. But it was not the only doomsday power that we have created or will create. Ray Kurzweil argues that not only is, it our, is our technological progress rapidly increasing, but the rate of acceleration itself is accelerating. We are at the knee of an exponential curve of advancement where the next 100 years could bring technological advancement equivalent to the last 20,000. Our power is increasing at an exponential rate. We don't know what the future will bring, but whether it is from a low-cost form of geoengineering that could catastroph catastrophically disrupt our biosphere, biotech, nanotech, or some other source, our capacity to destroy ourselves is escalating, and our wisdom about how to use this power must escalate with it. It must because history is littered with the boom and bust cycle of civilizations. Jared Diamond tells us that the Roman Empire and many others devastated their environments, a key factor that led to their collapse. But we are the first civilization to encompass all of humanity and the first to have the capacity to destroy human life as we know it. The collapse of our civilization would almost certainly bring this result. And so that is why we cannot accept the politics and cycles of our history. Because stand or fall, we are the last civilization. So what do we do? 70% of the world feel that the greatest challenges humanity has ever faced are happening right now. When campaigners or policymakers face a problem, we often use a simple tool of a strategy tree. Put your goal at the top and tell a story in a series of steps about how you get there. Let's take our goal as survival through the basic version of the world that most people everywhere want, with peace, rule of law, human rights, an end to poverty, environmental sustainability, social justice, and cohesion. It's not a utopia. It's roughly the difference between Sweden and Somalia, Costa Rica, and Congo. So how do we get there? On issue by issue, when you try to find a path to change, you usually have to make one stop at some point. Government. Government is potentially the worst enemy of our collective aspirations or our most powerful tool to build the world that we dream of. There is no question of ignoring it. Those who believe that government is inherently inefficient and corrupt and incompetent, that it can be bypassed, have often been sold a fake bill of goods by others who know exactly how powerful and effective government can be and want to use it for their own ends. So both because it is our most powerful and indispensable tool and our greatest threat, government belongs at the top of our strategy tree. 
What kind of government would get us to our goal? Government that is highly accountable to people, a highly functioning democracy. If we build highly functioning democracies at local, national, and global levels, and in a critical mass of the world's nations, they would pass laws and make policies that reflected the world that most people everywhere want. It's the most powerful single way to reach our goal. So it's the first step in our plan to save the world. How do we create a highly functioning democracy? I believe we can see a list of key ingredients and strategies that get us there. First, we need a certain kind of media sector because the media holds sway over our entire awareness of our world and democratic decisions are, not on, are, not, are only as good as the information we have in making them. It's unacceptable that in many countries, a few individuals can own most of our media and use that power for political ends. We need a series of reforms that break up the empires and the power of the media barons and regulate the sometimes corrupt nexus of media and politics. Second, we need highly functioning political parties sector. First and foremost, we have to get money out of politics to make sure that our representatives are accountable to people. In many, in many developing countries, there is simply no sufficient source of political financing that is not corrupting. Political parties are tremendously powerful mediators of democratic life, but often shockingly unscrutinized. In some countries, one individual can actually own a political party. We need a package of reforms to ensure that parties are accountable and effective vessels of democracy. Third, our government institutions need to change and evolve. Our systems of democracy are highly imperfect. They were largely developed in a time when societies were locked in a death struggle between two ideologies, each convinced of the false consciousness of the other. In that context, politics was war by other means, and it made sense to have winner-take-all, last-standing processes. But this hackish adversarial politics doesn't resonate with my generation. Deliberative democratic theory offers us an alternative, where democracy is less like a boxing ring, where interests duke it out, and more like a table and a conversation in which people listen and speak and sincerely consider our challenges and the common good. To take an example, what if we behaved like ancient Athens or like the community I serve and randomly chose juries of citizens to approve, consider and approve or reject the proposals of leaders, with the bar for approval being not 50%, but 80%. Fourth, we need certain practices and institutions of citizenship. Many of us are not engaged in public life, even to the point of voting, and fatalism and cynicism are rife. People too often take leave of their senses and their wisdom when they discuss politics. We need to foster a culture where we encourage and support each other to be citizens and to step up to our responsibilities to be wise stewards of our societies, in part through movements and organizations that enable and empower citizenship rather than factional agendas. What if we oriented our public education curriculum towards this goal? What if, as Bruce Ackerman suggested, we were all given a deliberation day off to gather before elections to sincerely engage with each other on the choice before us? There are many more items on this ingredient list for a highly functioning democracy. The point is, for each of these, we can now imagine a series of strategies to get there. And for each of those sub-strategies, we can imagine a group or groups, citizen groups, coalitions, political parties, government agencies, that might be organized and formed to pursue them. Once we've worked out that detail, we have a plan. Call it a 20-year plan to save the world. I'm passionate about this plan, but more passionate about the idea of having a plan that brings us together one with room and respect for the diverse strategies that people might choose to get to our common goals. Because when we recognize a shared goal and support each other's roles in achieving it, then we've created something very powerful, a team. But this kind of plan for reforms to achieve highly functioning democracies is not yet deep enough. Institutional agendas offer us the next step for the march of democracy. But history teaches us that even the most beautiful constitution and systems of checks and balances and well-conceived institutional structure and body of law will often fail if it's not infused with a culture of people that takes the spirit and the values of that system and that democracy to heart and reflects it in their individual choices and actions. Margaret Mead said, 
Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. In my experience, it's about thoughtful, committed citizens working together in highly performing teams that really change the, changes the world. And those teams can be very small or absolutely massive. Every single piece of that 20-year plan will stand or fall based on whether highly functioning teams and organizations in civil society, government, and elsewhere can be formed to implement it. Management, that stale sounding word, is absolutely central to our ability to meet the challenge of our time. Management is about the excellence with which we human beings make common cause and achieve change together. And the public sector, from dysfunctional NGOs to vast government bureaucracies, is poorly managed. The private sector is often, also often horrendously managed, but offers us some of the most advanced experiments in managing human enterprises at scale. Our largest and most successful firms are perfecting different approaches. Built to last, the seminal management practice book profiles the leading firms in 50 industries and finds a powerful common denominator, culture. A strong culture and understanding between people of what their work is, what values they employ, and how they go about it unlocks the capacity for collective human excellence. But in my experience, for the inter institutions of the public sector, this is barely on their radar. I have yet to speak to a single person at the United Nations that talks about proactively defining and inspiring the organizational culture of that institution, despite the obvious need. And as much as the ownership of the media sector is a problem, I believe the culture of our media professionals is often a much greater problem. 80% of journalists believe they're more cynical than the general population. And I think they're right. That cynicism and a host of other cultural qualities dims the promise of even some of our most virtuous journalists to tell us an accurate story of who we are and what's happening in the world. So we need a revitalization of the culture and management of our public institutions and our public sector. Because the reason we fail is not just because the forces of regress are strong, but because the forces of progress are too weak. Our civil society institutions, our governments, our international organizations and social movements are fraught. They're strangled by petty internecine conflicts, ego battles, competitions for status and privilege, false and proxy debates, and cynical co competition between departments and individuals. In this unsupportive environment, we get burned, fearful, and we often become highly risk averse and controversy allergic. We spend a lot of our time and energy covering our asses. And along the way, our inspiring purpose and charge gets lost. Our power and the institutions that could channel our democratic power are constrained by this failure to create healthy, effective cultures. But that progress to a realization of our civic culture cannot be achieved without what UN Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld called a journey within, a profound journey that involves each of our individual abilities to come from hope and love over fear and anger. We can't build the teams, the organizations, the leadership, and the society we want without that journey. Speaking for myself, I find a direct relationship between the quality of my leadership and my judgment in the world, how effective I am in bringing change, and my own journey within. I have found that how I react when I feel, for example, that someone is attacking me, challenging my competence or authority, taking credit from me, is both hugely important for what I can offer the world and hugely dependent on my journey within. And on that journey, I have found that almost every negative emotion I feel towards someone else or something else, I can trace to some problem or embarrassment with myself. And if I love and accept myself completely, I have nothing but patience and love for others. I love my dad. He was hard on me. His dad was hard on him. Sometimes I think a deep part of me, that older emotional lizard part of my brain, thought as a result that he didn't love me. 
But now I know that that was a falsehood born of fear. And I believe that realizing that truth, not just intellectually but emotionally, has set me and my dad and the children I will have someday free. There is a symmetry to things. To save our civilization, we must love and hope and believe. But we cannot love and believe in others until we love and believe in ourselves. That is why we must walk the journey within. So politics is personal. The personal is political. And our capacities as communities are an aggregate function of all of our individual journeys within and our abilities to bring hope over fear and love over anger. In graduate school, I read Human Rights Watch reports about the unspeakable brutalities committed by the RUF rebels in Sierra Leone. I burned with a fire to stop these things from happening, and maybe also with a young man's fire to prove to myself that I was public-spirited enough to do it. I left for Sierra Leone right after graduation and traveled inland to meet the RUF. There I spent hours with a commander and challenged him over the killing of civilians. His explanation was honest and angry, fearful, self-righteous. But while his actions were grotesque, I could see in his path to them all the same forces of fear and anger at work in me, in all of us. And that understanding, that empathy, enabled me to see that there but for grace go I. And to shift from a feeling of a fire within me that, that burned against him and the way the world is, and towards, I believe, a much more powerful fire that burns for what the world could be. The great thinker Jeremy Rifkin has brilliantly charted the emergence of what he terms our empathic civilization. How our evolving understanding of ourselves is driving greater and greater abilities to empathize with each other. Neuroscience is proving to us that we are not the rational, cold, selfish creatures we've often been told we were. We are empathetic creatures that crave connection above all else. Solitary confinement is our greatest torture. It drives us mad, and we are connected in ways that we have only begun to understand. And Rifkin points out that the discipline of psychology is just 100 years old. Words like ego, self-esteem, personal growth, have just been invented. With the consciousness that these concepts bring, our capacity to engage with the challenges of that journey within is rapidly expanding. Positive psychology, the school that moves beyond treating illness to looking to enhance our health, is barely a decade old. One of the most exciting concepts in this school comes from Carol Dweck at Stanford University. In her book, Mindset, she shows how the success of individuals in virtually every aspect of our lives and communities is heavily influenced by whether we have a growth or a fixed mindset. Whether we believe that our abilities are created through hard work and effort, or whether they're innately fixed. When we are growth mindset, we embrace our challenges, welcome feedback, and work far better with others. And a growth mindset can be taught. So yes, we are on an exponential curve of interdependence, vulnerability, and power to destroy ourselves but we are also on an exponential curve of our power to understand each other, accept and improve ourselves, and work together in flourishing teams and communities and movements and societies. The fearful fictions that have divided us are falling away and the truth is setting us free. And that's why I feel a profound optimism at this moment. Because what I see happening in this march of democracy is a deep flowering of human potential. I am here as a steward of a community of tens of millions of hopeful citizens from every corner of this earth. But I'm here at this, the commonwealth of nations, governments, some of whom commit grave human rights abuses. And I'm speaking in this hall that is the beating heart of the world's largest, most powerful, and unaccountable financial industry. And I came here to tell you that we're coming. Democracy is coming but we're not bringing fire and destruction or self-involved activist narcissism or blind ideology this time. Democracy is young, but we're learning the lessons of our budding history. And this time, we are bringing love and hope and a democratic sensibility and an intelligent engagement with the problems that we all face. 
And it is because of that love and that hope that this time we, all of us together, will bring a more profound and sustainable and unstoppable change and transformation than we've ever seen before. And all of us together will meet the challenge and seize the opportunity of our time. Thank you. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the Commonwealth Secretary-General, His Excellency, Mr. Kamalesh Sharma. Former Lord Mayor, Your Excellencies, Lords, ladies and gentlemen, since the Commonwealth Lecture was inaugurated, it has been delivered by many notable men and women, eminent in many different spheres of public life. The first lecture, back in 1998, was delivered by Professor Amartya Sen, winner of the Nobel Prize for Economic Science. A great champion of the Commonwealth, Professor Sen went on to chair the Commonwealth Commission on respect and understanding, which issued its report, Civil Parts to Peace, in 2007. The report, and Professor Sen himself, made much of solutions based on the multiple identities of each individual. I'm reminded of this by the multiple Commonwealth identities of Rick and Patel bringing together Canada, India, Kenya, Sierra Leone, and the UK, and more besides, I'm sure. This evening, we have witnessed the good effect to which he has built on that global heritage of the Commonwealth and drawn on his own first-hand experience of the diverse cultures of our member states. It is particularly apt in the week that we move from one Commonwealth theme to another and the transition from connecting cultures to opportunity through enterprise that the Commonwealth lecture should be delivered by one who so eminently exemplifies both. But as somebody who is responsible for the largest online community in the world, he obviously carries a big responsibility, which he has modestly somewhere described as the simple democratic mission of closing the gap between the world we have and the world most people everywhere want. But we have seen just now that he has thought deeply about it and what was notable in his lecture today were the big ideas with which he has challenged us. Indeed, that was a sentence he used. Something big is happening. And from these, I would note the following. The sense of urgency that time is not on our side. In fact, this century is a unique century because there is no problem which we face in this century which is amenable to being transferred to the next one. We've either succeeded in solving the dilemmas and problems we have, or we have not. But this century has to, to decide that. The idea of inclusiveness, that there's no solution which can be found by some people by not involving the others. But above all, the sense of working with hope and confidence we must have in our ability, in fact, to succeed. 
the term he used was a responsibility we have to dream. The centrality he gives to women, which is the oldest prejudice of, represents the oldest prejudice of mankind. The point he made about the balance between fragility and resilience, how strength as well as weakness are so finely balanced that it's only our wisdom in looking at it that can make the difference. But at the same time, the sense of a new freedom with which we are also challenged, a sense of a transformation which can define our future forever, the grip of metamorphosis which we cannot deny, and that we have a global destiny in the shaping. That we are dying to one world, which we all know, but what world, the new one we are born into, is in our hands. That our fate is bound up with each other, but community and cooperation can be the answer to this systemic transformation which is before us. And above all, his emphasis that these are not externalities we are talking about. These are, in the deepest sense, internalities. It is a journey within. In fact, he described it once as a fire within us. So the profound optimism with which he, he finished his presentation is something I think we should take away from it, from the lecture which he gave, what he called the flowering of the human potential. And I think in that sentiment, he did connect with the Commonwealth profoundly, because from its very inception, the Commonwealth has always represented this ability within ourselves, despite diversity geographically, despite the different experiences we have had historically, that we can be one community, stand on common ground, work towards a common goal, and be an aspirational community. I wish to welcome the new chair of the Commonwealth Foundation, Sir Anand Satyananda and Susan. What could be better for him as his first public engagement than to be able to preside over this Commonwealth lecture? Let me also thank Vijay Krishna Ryan, director of the Commonwealth Foundation, for once again organizing such a splendid occasion. I congratulate him and the diligent members of the Commonwealth Foundation team. Much gratitude is owed too to the Lord Mayor and to the City Corporation for their generosity in providing the splendid setting for the lecture and for their very warm hospitality. We value immensely the continuing and continuing, uh, continuing and strengthening partnership that exists between the Commonwealth and the City of London, for which I thank the Lord Mayor. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, will you kindly remain in your seats for a few moments until the front row guests have left the hall. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That concludes this evening's lecture. 
Will you please now make your way to the old library for the reception? You may use the south doors by the curtains, the west door at the far end. Please make your way out and go to the old library for the reception. Thank you so much.